Welcome to Hub History, the show that brings you fascinating stories from Boston history. This week is episode six, the first Boston Revolution. Hi, I'm Nikki. And I'm Jake. And this week we're going to be telling the story of a time when Boston rose up in revolt, overthrowing the widely hated royal governor. The militia massed in Charlestown and surrounded the city, while the Royal Navy backed British authorities. But we're not talking about Lexington, or Concord, or Bunker Hill. We're talking about the 1689 revolt against Governor Edmund Andros and the Dominion of New England, almost a century before the Revolutionary War started. It is true that Boston has always been a rebellious town, and we're going to see how this early revolt helped pave the road to revolution. But first, it's time to take a look at what's coming up this week in Boston history. Monday is December 5th, and that's the date in 1997 when Goodwill Hunting was released. It's still my favorite movie set in Boston, though most of the landmarks featured in the movie are long gone. How do you like them apples? On December 6th, 1917, a massive explosion tore through Halifax, Nova Scotia. It was the largest explosion in history until the nuclear attack on Hiroshima. And in the wake of the disaster, Boston rushed an emergency relief train through the snow to bring food, tents, doctors, and medical supplies to the devastated city. The next year, Halifax sent us a Christmas tree to say thanks, and since 1971, this has become an annual tradition, and this year the Halifax tree was lit on Boston Common on December 1st. Wednesday is December 7th, which is Pearl Harbor Day. It's also the day in 1930 when a Boston CBS station, W1WX, aired the nation's first television commercial. Thanks for that, W1WX. I guess. On December 8, 1792, Vice President John Adams was worried that he'd be re-elected to that position, saying in a letter to Abigail, You will know more of the election before this reaches you than I do. It does not appear that I am born to so good fortune as to be a mere farmer in my old age. Fire gutted through Boston's townhouse on December 9, 1747. Also known as the Courthouse, today we call it the Old State House. And because the townhouse was the seat of government, the fire destroyed many irreplaceable colonial records. The province records, books, papers, pictures, or anything else in the chambers, to the inestimable loss of the province. We'll link to a 1747 news report about the fire in today's show notes. Saturday is December 10th, and Hugh O'Brien was elected as Boston's first Irish-American mayor on December 10th, 1884. Mayor O'Brien was a popular leader and paved the way for the generations of Irish-American politicians to come. And finally, Sunday is December 11th, which marks the 160th anniversary of the Tripartite Indenture, which was an agreement between the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the City of Boston, and the Boston Water Power Company. With this agreement, the city was able to begin draining and filling the tidal swamp that's today's Back Bay neighborhood. We'll have a link to the tripartite indenture and city records in the show notes for this episode. Now, before we talk about the 1689 Boston Revolt, let's just set the stage a little bit. A half a century after they were founded, the New England colonies were vying for power with the British crown. The power struggle between the local elected governments and King Charles II came to a head when the Massachusetts Charter of 1629 The founding document that gave the government of Massachusetts Bay Colony its legitimacy is revoked in 1684. The Crown has been looking for ways to make colonies more profitable. And remember that many colonies, including Massachusetts, were originally founded as profit-making enterprises. In the meantime, they've become very independent and they're not sending much money back home. One of the last acts of King Charles II before his death is to create the Dominion of New England. By order of the King, Massachusetts Bay Colony, Plymouth Colony, the province of Maine, and Narragansett are joined in one colony that's going to be directly ruled by an appointed royal governor, not the local councils that had been in power for 50 years. Soon, the Crown expands the Dominion to include Rhode Island and Providence Plantations, Connecticut, New York, and East and West Jersey. So the Dominion is huge. It stretches from Pennsylvania all the way up to Canada. 
Yes, and it's made up of people from different cultural and religious backgrounds with very little in common. Now, after Charles's death, his brother, James II, takes the throne in 1685. And James had converted to Catholicism, which, if you recall in our first episode on early Boston's anti-Catholic celebration of Pope's Day, you can imagine that James isn't going to be very popular with the New England Puritans. Nevertheless, the first governor the king appoints is a local, Joseph Dudley, but he's largely seen as an ineffective leader. Eventually, Dudley is replaced with Sir Edmund Andros. Andros had previously served as the Bailiff of Guernsey, which is one of the Channel Islands, and then as Governor of New York. He arrives in Boston on December 20th, 1686, and immediately offends the Boston Puritans by publicly celebrating Christmas. And, and keep in mind that the Puritans had outlawed Christmas celebrations from 1659 to 1681. So this was not getting off on the right foot with the locals. Once he's in office, Andros governs by personal fiat. He doesn't feel like he is in any way beholden to the traditional forms of government provided under our colonial charter, so he dissolves the legislature and appoints an advisory council. Since he's charged by the king with raising revenues from the colonies, he raises taxes. But since taxes had previously been imposed by the elected legislature, the new taxation without representation is not popular. Colonists feel like they've been betrayed by their country, that they're not being granted their constitutional rights as Englishmen under the Magna Carta. And after his initial religious friction with the Puritans over Christmas, Andros also makes a point of promoting Anglicism. In his eyes, he's trying to make New England safe for the Church of England, but Puritans see him as imposing an unwelcome sect that's suspiciously similar to the Catholicism that they hate and fear. By 1687, he essentially takes over Old South Church for Church of England services, and then he orders King's Chapel to be built right on top of the first Puritan burying ground in the city. As you can imagine, Bostonians are quickly getting fed up with Sir Edmund Andros, and their countrymen back in Old England are also quickly getting fed up with His Royal Highness James II. Reading the unrest, a Protestant Prince of Holland known as William of Orange invades England in 1688 the first invasion since the Normans in 1066. In a stroke of genius, William times the invasion to fall on November 5th, Guy Fawkes Day, which fans the flames of English Protestant resentment of Catholic James II, and it rallies many Englishmen to his banner. And if you want to catch up on the history of Guy Fawkes Day in England and in early Boston, go back and listen to episode one. The invasion is successful, it becomes known as the Glorious Revolution, and William and Mary take the throne in February 1689. News of the revolution reaches Boston by late March. That seems very fast for that era. It was, and as far as I can tell, Boston had gotten word of William's invasion by March, but maybe not of its success. Before dawn, on April 18, 1689, the militia begins to mass in Charlestown and Roxbury, just outside the city. And at 8 a.m., they march into the city and start arresting Crown officials, including the captain of HMS Rose, the British warship that is the main Crown military force in Boston at that time. And they read a declaration of grievances in the market square, blaming Andros for a horrid popish plot, and claiming that they are acting in support of the noble undertaking of the Prince of Orange, to preserve the three kingdoms from the horrible brinks of popery and slavery. And we'll have a link to the full text of that declaration, which helped inspire the later Declaration of Independence in today's show notes. And the militia, now with reinforcements and help from a growing mob, lay siege to Andros in the garrison house he's staying in near Fort Hill. And former Governor Simon Bradstreet and leading citizens of Boston write a letter demanding Andros's surrender, for his own safety, or the mob will storm his fort. And we'll have a link to that letter in the show notes for this episode as well. Now, instead of surrendering, Governor Andros makes a break for the Rose, which he has no captain, of course, and he's caught by the militia. And the crew of the Rose and a small contingent of soldiers at Castle William, which today, that's where Fort Independence is at Castle Island, hold out until the next day, but then they also surrender to the colonial militia. 
Andros ends up being imprisoned at Castle William for almost a year. He escapes briefly in August. Colonial leaders say that he was dressed as a woman, but that's probably just propaganda. Then he gets shipped back to England, where all charges against him are dropped. At the Commonwealth Museum, there's a great interactive display that portrays Edmund Andros during his imprisonment at Castle William. Although I don't think it's part of his official IMDb profile, the actor is Jim Trufrost from The Wire. And any fans of the HBO series The Wire will recognize Detective Roland Prez Prezbaluski in a colonial wig. I'll have a side-by-side picture of the real Andros and Trufrost in the show notes for today's episode. Now, with the arrest of Andros, there's a similar rebellion in May and June in New York, led by Jacob Leisler. Then, the Dominion of New England collapses, and more or less by default, the old colonies go back to their former systems of government. In the end, a new charter, sometimes known as the Charter of William and Mary, is issued to Massachusetts in 1691, but it fundamentally changes the colony. Puritan rule is undermined, and the former colonies of Massachusetts Bay, Plymouth, and Maine are all combined into a single entity. And they'll remain combined until Maine becomes a state in 1820. For better or worse, Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth remain a single state today. For worse, some might say. Including me. We'll include a link to the 1691 Charter, which is also at the Commonwealth Museum, in the show notes for today's episode. And now we move on to my favorite segment, listener feedback. We received a request from a listener named Dan for a show about organized crime in Boston. And we're considering a future episode on the 1933 murder of Charles King Solomon at the Cotton Club in the South End, or perhaps on the rivalry between the Irish American Gustin gang and the Italian American mob during the 1920s and 30s. So in a self-serving solicitation for more listener feedback, Which gangland story do you think we should bring you first? Now, as long as we're soliciting story ideas, I want to hear what your favorite underground location in Boston is, past or present. Is it the smugglers' tunnels in the North End, abandoned tunnels and forgotten tea stations? Whatever it is, let us know your favorite subterranean stories for a show to come. Okay, where can people find out more about the 1689 Boston Revolt? We'll post an image of the letter calling for Andros to surrender, the full text of the Declaration of Grievances that the rebels published, an actual portrait of Governor Andros next to the version portrayed by Jim Trufrost, as well as a link to the Charter of William and Mary in the show notes for this week's episode at hubhistory.com 006. If you want to get in touch with us, we're on Facebook at facebook.com hubhistory, And our Twitter handle is at HubHistory. You can email us at podcast at HubHistory.com or go to HubHistory.com and click on the Contact Us link. While you're there, be sure to click on Subscribe to see all the ways that you can subscribe to the show. We're on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, TuneIn Radio, and Player FM. And if we're not on your favorite podcast app, drop us a line and let us know. That's all for now. We'll be back next time with a show about Jane Topin, the Nightmare Nurse. <laughs>